So we'll talk briefly about solving some differential equations. Um, I mean, this is sort of more heavily focused in the textbook, but I cut a lot of that material out of this curriculum just because it's always very specialized and then it never works in any of the real world models. So it feels like, well, what's any of this for? Um, but there are some differential equations that are so kind of elementary, we should be able to solve them, at least in theory. In section 1.2, we can talk about using integration to solve differential equations. And this is in the very specific case that dy dx is a function of x, we can solve by integrating both sides and getting that y is the integral of f of x dx. So this is a very special type of differential equation. And it's not one that shows up a whole lot. Well, that's not true. It's um, It shows up in some situations. So the point here is that the rate of change of y depends on x and only x. It doesn't depend on itself. And a lot of differential equations don't have this property. Like, if y is an animal population and x is time, then when we were looking at models on Tuesday, we proposed two different models, dy dx equals k times y, or dy dx equals k times y times m minus y, and observe that neither of these differential equations is of the form on the left, because y um, rather than x is on the right side of the equality. So it's pretty specialized, but if you have it, you can, at least in theory, solve it as a calculus exercise. And I say in theory, because we know that doing integration is not always such an easy thing. And in fact, doing integration by hand is often impossible. dy dx equals the sine of one over x. A perfectly nice differential equation with a perfectly nice solution. But as for what that integral is, there is no way to compute it by hand. You need to use Wolfram Alpha or MATLAB or Mathematica or some kind of computer software system to get the graph of what it approximately is. So even when this method works, it can still run into problems. Still, maybe, maybe that was kind of a weird way to leave. 
read by starting with an example where it doesn't work. We can certainly write down examples where it does work just fine. dy dx equals x squared. Then y is the integral of x squared dx is one third x cubed plus a constant of integration. I talked about this Tuesday. In general, we expect differential equations to have infinitely many solutions. <laughs> And then you might have some data point that makes, that collapses it down to a single solution. If we added an initial value, y of zero equals three, then suddenly this infinite number of solutions becomes a single solution because this allows you to solve for C. C is three. Um, so when we do this, we'll always get an infinite class of solutions because we'll always get a constant of integration. And then if we have an initial condition that will take that infinite class of solutions and collapse it down to a single solution. We could call this a theorem if we wanted to. Differential equations, as I teach it, is not a theoretical class, but theorem. Say that f of x is continuous on the interval from a to b. Then the differential equation dy dx equals f of x has infinitely many solutions. And those solutions can be found by using integration, at least theoretically. Y equals the integral of f of x dx. A data point, and usually it's y of zero, but it doesn't have to be. Y of c equals d. Yeah. makes the solution unique. So dy dx equals, oh, I don't know, the, the sine of x. And this time, let's give let's give a different data point instead of y of 0 equals something. Let's say we know y of pi. y of pi equals 0. Uh, 
wait a minute. Yep, nope, that's right. Y equals the integral of sine of x dx. It's the negative cosine of x plus c. Uh, looking ahead a bit, I mean, we'll be doing a bit of integration in this course. We're not going to be using a bunch of complicated integration techniques, though. So if you just sort of remember the basics of calculus two, you should be fine. So y is the negative cosine of x plus c, y of pi is the negative cosine of pi plus c. And if my unit circle isn't failing me, that would be one. The cosine of pi is negative one, so the negative cosine is positive one. And then we want this to equal zero. So C equals negative one. And that um, initial condition, we still call it that, even though it's no longer initial, it's y of pi instead of y of zero. That initial condition allows us to go from an infinite number of solutions to a single solution. The same method works for higher order differential equations, except that you'll need to do more integration and you'll need more initial conditions to make a solution unique. So what I mean by that, so here's a second order differential equation. So the second derivative equals x. If we integrate both sides on the left, the integral of the second derivative is the first derivative. It's stating this, you know, a little informal to state it this way, but the fundamental theorem says that derivatives and integrals undo each other. So if we integrate both sides, We get that. So now dy dx, one half x squared plus c, we integrate both sides. y equals one six x cubed plus cx plus d. So we dealt with the second order differential equation in basically the same way using integration. Let's now tackle that statement I made that we need more initial values to make solutions unique. Let's give us an initial value. Y of zero equals one. So we come down here, come down here, y of zero is a d. Everything else gets multiplied by zero and goes away. So if y of zero is gonna equal one, 
then D has to equal one. But this is still an infinite class of solutions because that C can still be anything. And um, when we talk about having more data, there are a few sort of types of data you could have. If we gave two pieces of information about y, like y of three equals four, that would allow you to solve for y uniquely and give you a unique solution. Um, what we tend to have though, in higher order situations, we tend to have information about y, and then we tend to have information about the lower order derivatives. y of zero equals one, y prime of zero equals negative two. This would be a pretty typical example of the data that you have in most real world problems. And then let's clear that out. So we could solve for the constants of integration as we go now. Let me dy dx, let me instead use function notation. y prime of x equals one half x squared plus c. y prime of zero is c. And it also is negative two. So this gives us C. And now Y of X is one over six X cubed minus two X plus a constant of integration y of zero equals d, but y of zero should also equal one. So d equals one. And we've got our unique solution, but we needed more than the one initial condition. We needed two initial conditions to make this work. And in general, theorem, it isn't some kind of wacky coincidence that the first order equation needs one initial condition and the second order equation needs two initial conditions. Theorem, let's say we have an nth order differential equation of this type. Where once again, we assume f of x equal is continuous. This has an infinite class of solutions, which at least theoretically, assuming you can do the integration, are obtained by repeated integration. G 
Here we had a second order and we integrated twice. We integrated to go from X to the quadratic, and then we integrated a second time to go from the quadratic to the cubic. If this were a third order equation, we'd have had to integrate three times. If it was fourth order, we'd have had to integrate four times. And so on. So we'll get an infinite class of solutions. It, that infinite class will turn in a to a single unique solution if you're given n initial values. And typically that's going to be y of a equals something y prime of a equals something y w prime of a equals something and so on. So typically you'll have an initial value for each derivative. That statement I made, typically you'll have an initial value for each derivative. I mean, think of, well, we can, I guess, do an example. But think of examples from calculus, because I mean, at this point, we're just doing calculus problems dressed up a little. And you know, the most sort of standard and famous example of anti-differentiation you see in calculus is messing around with heights and velocities and acceleration. So, An object is tossed upwards from a height of four feet. with a velocity of 12 feet per second. Any rising, well, let's say any falling object, but this is also true for the part where the object is rising up. But any falling object has an acceleration of negative 32 feet per second squared. When will this object hit the ground? I mean, this is a pretty typical calculus problem in terms of, you know, trying to use this differential equation notation. 
we're interested in the height. Or, I mean, we're interested in when the object hits the ground, but that's when its height above the ground is zero. So to answer that question, we want to find the height, then we can set it equal to zero. Well, the, the derivative of the position function is the velocity. The derivative of the velocity function is the acceleration. So we're given a second derivative of what we're interested in. We're interested in the height, which you may remember is traditionally abbreviated S from the German. We're told that the second derivative of the height is negative 32. That's, I never remember, even now. Okay, the two goes between them on the top and after on the bottom. So we're given that, and then we're told information about the height at some moment. We're told that the height starts at four, four feet above the ground at the moment of release. And we're given information about the derivative. Because we're given information about the velocity, the object's thrown with. We're told that it's thrown upwards at 12 feet per second. So you see, we're given this differential equation, we're given the function at a value, we're given the derivative of the function at a value. And this is what I said we needed to uniquely solve the differential equation using integration. So the ds dt, which let's also note that ds dt is velocity. The S dt is the integral of the second derivative. Getting ahead of myself. Which is negative 32t plus c. And we're told that the velocity of zero equals 12. The velocity at zero is also C. So C equals 12. And now the height. The height is the integral of the velocity. Negative 16 t squared plus 12 t plus a constant of integration. And just as with the velocity, we use an initial condition. To find that constant of integration. In this case, 
computer seeing why zero can be such a convenient value. We plug zero into S, the negative 16 goes away, the 12 goes away, you're just left with D. And that's supposed to be four. So D has to be four. And you have solved your differential equation, which is not actually what the question asks. The question asks, when will the object hit the ground? But solving the differential equation was a necessary step. And I'm just going to, I mean, we could use the quadratic form to the, we could try to factor, although it probably doesn't factor. I'm going to take the easy way out. You wouldn't know it from the textbook sometimes, but in fact, mathematicians love taking the easy way out. If we can avoid having to factor some messy polynomial by just going to Desmos, that just makes our day. Negative 16 T squared plus 12 T plus four. Oh, guess it, though well, it wouldn't have factored nicely because one of our roots is a fraction, but by a total coincidence, we get a very nice answer. It hits the ground after one second. And that is section one point. You know, you can make the problems harder by making the calculus harder. You y x equals two over two plus x squared. I mean, this is, this is a pain, and it's just a pain because because this integral is not easy to deal with. Um, this requires a bit of u substitution and an arc tangent. I don't know if you remember the arc tangent. Again, once we get out of this chapter, we're not really gonna be taking integrals anymore. Um, The point of this messy nonsense is that let's see, is that we can integrate one plus one over one plus u squared. So we want to now well, let me not rush ahead, especially because I think I might have made some kind of error. So we want to make this denominator look like one plus something squared. 
So if we pull a two out, it now looks like one plus half of something squared. So we're getting there. But we don't want half of something squared. We just want something squared. Well, so here's where that square root I wrote down comes into play. We can rewrite this. As one plus the one over the square root of two x squared. Then we can do a u substitution because we still don't have what we want. What we want is one plus our variable squared. The point of the u substitution is to make this our variable. The denominator turns into one plus u squared. I'm not forgetting this. The two over two is one. It goes away. But what about dx? du is one over the square root of two dx. And we don't have that. We have dx. There's no one over the square root of two in front of it. The trick, as you might remember, is to just put the thing we need in, but also to multiply by its reciprocal, or to divide by it, if you prefer. We haven't changed the function at all. We've added a one over the square root of two, but we've also put in a square root of two to cancel that out. But now we have du. The square root of two pulls out of the integral. And as we may or may not have committed to memory, probably not if we don't each calculate this two every year, but one over one plus u squared is the arc tangent. I mean, it has the arc tangent as its antiderivative. Then u is one over the square root of two x. And there you go. And this problem was obviously more work than the, you know, toss an object into the air problem but we approached it exactly the same way. I mean, we approached it using integration. It's just that the integral was messier this time around. Any questions? Then that's actually 